everyone, and welcome back to the Pediatric Speech Sisters show. I am so thankful to have my guest on here today. His name is ITL Barrera, and he is here to talk to us a bit about how we can better nurture men in the special education space. Uh, a lot of us listening to this are speech language pathologists, or maybe you're an educator, or maybe you're in healthcare. Wherever you are, there is really just overall a huge shortage of men. I haven't worked with a lot of men myself, especially special education. So I'm excited to hear about your perspective today. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm super excited to be here and to share this space with you. This is you know, such a wonderful podcast that I've been following since fall. Um, and just the number of topics that you bring about you know, in terms of, you know, cultural appropriate practices and um, really fostering uh, just the need for more people of color in the profession in our field. So I I'm super excited and happy to be here with you. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you so much for those words too, because already I'm already thinking of a kajillion questions that I want to ask you. Um, but let me go ahead and do your introduction. So, ITL holds a Bachelor of Art in Human Development, a Master of Science in Special Education, with an emphasis on early childhood special education and an early childhood special education teaching credential. He has nine years of experience working in special education and holds the most experience in working with preschoolers with autism in visually structured classrooms. Also working with students from farm working communities and military families. As a doctoral student, he currently works at an infant toddler center in Cerritos, California. Correct. Cerritos, California, okay. Where he works as an early intervention special teacher for students on an IFSP. Here, he works with students with speech and language impairments and physical disabilities. He also works as a graduate assistant at CSULA. Some of his research interests include, but are not limited to, the impact of male teachers on students with disabilities, working with culturally and linguistically diverse students in special education, training parents to utilize assistive technology at home, improving the effectiveness of various curriculums and scientific-based practices in early childhood special education, paraeducator support and welfare and early childhood teacher training. What don't you do? <laughs> for our community. Well, no, I, I think that, thank you so much for that introduction. And yeah, that kind of encapsulates a lot of my interests within the field and, and, and just pulling out a little bit of what I've learned through being in the field for uh, nine years and working at different in different parts of California and going through the whole schooling. So thank you so much. It, I'm so excited. It's I'm still learning and still changing. So of <laughs> course, and really, we should we should be thanking you really um, because you not only are you educating us, and not only are you educating the children that you're serving, you're also educating the families that you're serving. And I'm just looking at your bio. I'm looking at all of these different cultures that you serve: farm working communities, military families, and then of course, I'm sure children of color are sprinkled in there. So. Wow. Um, so before we get into the talk today, can you tell us a little bit about your why? My why? Great, great question. So um, I, I am a military kid myself. So I grew up, you know, as a Navy kiddo, moving, moving everywhere, different schools almost every year. Um, and so I think a big part of, uh, of why I am who I am is just my pathway and how I grew up. Uh, my, my mom was a, a child care provider in the military base. Uh, my dad was a nurse in the military base. And so um, just growing up in Okinawa, always being surrounded with kids all the time. And my mom being that nurturing person who uh, had all these kids, taught all these kids, different grade levels coming from different backgrounds uh, because it is military. And so um, a lot of us were kind of just put into this bubble of just being forced to meet new people and have that diverse uh, group of people and group of kids that you just grew up with, right? And so um, a lot of it stems from there. And, and so as I uh, was going into college, um, as soon as my father retired, we moved back to California and I'm based here now, of course, but um, uh, for the most part, I was thinking through my bachelor's of what exactly I wanted to do with my life. And uh, I, 
I was thinking at, in the beginning about going into occupational therapy. And so uh, a, a route for a lot of OTs is the human development route here in California. And so uh, my uncle had gone through that. A few friends that I've had have gone through that route. But what I loved most being an intern um, at like the, the inpatient hospitals was kind of the education portion of it. And, and that's kind of what led me into education. And, and so uh, I was a paraeducator for a few years, was a substitute teacher for a few years. So that really helped me kind of weed out exactly what I wanted to do in the field, which group of students I wanted to work with. And um, it wasn't until I was working as a paraeducator um, in kind of the early childhood spaces, uh, mostly the early intervention spaces, um, and, and especially in, in communities where I did have a lot of parents that were, you know, single mothers, you know, raising their kids and just me being a positive male role model for their students. Um, that was kind of a guiding light for me. Um, I don't want to say that I want to fill in that role as a father because, of course, that's not what I'm there to do. But I do want to um, help bring the importance of, of, of having these positive male figures in their lives at a young age, right? So that they can see that there are men in education and, and, and see that there are men in these uh, spaces that are traditionally not meant or not meant for men to be in because of these societal societal pressures and societal norms and expectations of them. So um, yeah, so I went ahead and went into my master's um, at Cal State Fullerton and I studied early childhood special education. Um, and decided to work in the migrant farm working communities and military communities of the Central Coast, so the Ventura area here in California. Um, there I've learned so much and it, it kind of feels like it's giving back to my roots of who I was. Um, of course, in military families, you see a lot of uh, fathers who can be deployed. You also see farm working families who are culturally and linguistically diverse. So. Um, you really do have a mix of parents who do need the supports, right? Who do need the extra care, love, care, and support. Um, and so that's what kind of lured me into that general area. So I worked there for four years and, and then thought to myself I, I, that I really do love um, kind of going back into college of just having really great um, professors who really taught me everything I knew more so about research and more so about how do we improve you know our community at a greater scale which is why i decided to get my get into my phd so now i'm at um i'm at cal state la ucla joint doc program and that's where we met we met through jada augustine a, a really great friend and colleague of, to both of us so yeah that's why i'm here and that's why we're here so yeah thanks yeah. again <laughs> Thank you so much for existing. Um, yeah, Jada reached out to me and she's like, I, you, you know Jada's personality. She's like really like excitable. Yeah. <laughs> she's like, I have this so person <laughs> he has to be on the show. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm so thankful that she connected us. Um, the next question I want to talk to you and ask you about is specifically how do you connect with this topic? Because the topic that's nurturing positive male role models. So what exactly does that mean to you? What that means to me is just representation. You know, I just in my cohort alone as a credential teacher, I believe there was only two of us in in a classroom of, of women, right? Which is great. I love the fact that there are women there and it's important that they're in these spaces to teach us as well. Um, mm -hmm. But it's just the lack of not having a lot of men in the field. And, and I think that also expands beyond just special education. I know um, there's not a lot of men in in speech and language pathology. And, and when you do find you know, a man of color in speech and language, pathology, they're also coined as the unicorns of their field. Yeah. And, and I think it's, it's important that representation of men in this field, it just is super important. I, I, I think of just 
kind of the experiences and the unique experiences of men of color, right? Where we do have, just depending on what culture you come from, it could be a little bit different, more masculine, more the machismo in, in Latino cultures or um, even in Black and Asian culture, of course, with, with Asian culture. Uh, for me personally, I wasn't really exposed to a lot of men in teaching positions. Um, I, I'd say in Philip for Filipinos, it's it's a lot of men in medical professions or you know business or you know becoming a doctor or a lawyer. So um, I I think maybe it's just me trying to figure out what is my true passion, you know. And I think that's where it should always stem from. Don't let societal expectations, don't let these stereotypes tell you about what type of gender roles you need to accomplish in your life. It, it really is about looking within, finding your passion, um, looking at your purpose, you know, figuring out what works for you and why you do what you do. Um, because I'm not going to let, you know, someone tell me, you know, you shouldn't be doing that job because you're a male, you know, because you're a guy. And, you know, that's just going to disregard all the work I've put in, you know, into helping these families and helping this, these communities that I've worked with. So and, and I'd like the same for other men, too, is to feel comfortable in, in understanding that your purpose and what you want to do is what you should do. Right. So, yeah. I like how you mentioned the topic of purpose because I thought about one of my, um, he's actually an undergrad student and he, of course, unfortunately, is the only male in his class. And mm -hmm. my class is about cultural competency, cultural responsiveness. And so the first class I'm asking, what is your culture? And of course, he's the one who's like, well, I'll actually, I'll go first. I'm the only male in this classroom. And so he talks about how his experience, of course, his classmates are very loving and kind to him. And you know, that that's never been a thing. And they look at him as a brother. Um, but when I asked and I went around and I had every student tell me about their why, why they were interested, he said, I'm actually still trying to figure out what my why is. Right. Yeah, and, and that's totally cool, you know? And, and that's what school is about. It, it, it helps unlock different layers to who you are, right? And, and I never thought that I would be in early childhood special education until I got to college. So um, I think the journey of people is constantly changing. Um, and, and I think that representation matters because men need more people in these roles to see like, oh, I want to be a teacher too. Oh, I want to be a speech therapist. Because let's be honest, if we ask children now or specifically boys, what do they want to be? Uh, I want to be a baseball player. I want to be a basketball player, which is all great. I love that for you. You know, uh, I want to be an astronaut. I want to be a doctor like dad. I want to be a lawyer. Um, but very seldom do we see, you know, I want to be a preschool teacher. Um, I really looked up to my teacher in second grade. I really want to be that. You know, I, I like how Mr. Diaz is, you know, uh, my th in third grade really helped me with my speech. I like how, you know, this person helped me with my OT. Uh, you know, it, it's just um, having that representation of different people in your environment, for especially for kids, to see that there are more, there's more to life than what we see on the media, what we see, you know, what our parents tell us to do, I think is important. Yeah. So the why is always changing. And, it's, you know, even for me, my why could change next year. You know? yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Yeah, my why has expanded and took twists and turns and everything. And I'm like, I, I don't know. I'm here for everything. I'm here for everything at this point. Yeah, yeah. So I love how you mentioned the media. Um, and I know that that was actually something that you really wanted to mention. Oh, yeah. So yeah. in your opinion, how has children's media played a role in societal expectations of men? Great question. That So I wanted to ask you, too, were you... A 90s kid, were you watching Nickelodeon? Were you watching PBS kids? And this is Disney way before, yes, Disney Junior. This is way before the iPads and, and you know, the iPads, the iPods and, and the iPhones. So um, a lot of our generation, I'd say maybe the millennial generation is, is specifically 
uh, our media, most of our media was the television. And, and so there were shows on there that I tuned into, you know, every day. And I know it can be a little bit, uh, there, there's such a, about having screen time nowadays, but back then we didn't know as much as we do now, but mm -hmm. I'd say a lot of the, the television shows that I watched, uh, especially especially like Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood or Gullah Gullah Island, you know, or Out of the Box or yes. Sesame Street and even Blue's Clues, those are all shows where they had men and women of color, you know, in the media. And as a Filipino, and as an Asian American, I didn't see a lot of uh, representation. So it was actually really great and really refreshing to see shows like Gullah Gullah Island, where we understood that culture, the Gullah cu culture. And, and so um, I, I, it's just super important to understand that everyone has different foods that they eat, different music that they listen to. Um, kids can feel identified when they watch these these shows right and i think i i think that my biggest inspiration is mr roger from mr roger's neighborhood what a pioneer in television and spe specifically um children's television where uh he has had a show since what the 60s or 70s and still pushing through social and and political issues that you wouldn't hear in children's television today. I mean, he had episodes where he would talk about um, students with special needs and why their voices need to be amplified. He also talked about really core issues in family dynamics, such as divorce, right? Um, anger issues. And, and most more specifically, um, I, I really loved an episode where he talked about race. You know, there's a really important episode uh, on Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood where around the time where a lot of the pools were, the swimming pools uh, were still segregated and, and him on his show having Officer Clemens, a black police officer come into his pool, dip his toes with him, you know, provide him a, re a refreshing and relaxing time to just relax and, and, and to talk and to be neighborly. That speaks volumes for something in the 19, what, 1969? So mm -hmm. you know, that for me, and they were still doing reruns of this show late into the 90s. And, and so I, I, I really do think that media plays such an important role in, in children's lives. Today, I'd say that uh, a show that is really important to me is Blue's Clues, because now it's a Filipino American on the show as the main host. And, and so this is the first time I'm seeing Filipino representation in the media for young children. And, and I think that's so important that, you know, he brings about topics of, you know, me and my grandma, my Lola, this is, this is how I treat her with kindness, with love, with respect. It, it's, it, it just shows, you know, a different side of, to my culture, but at the same time, shows that men can be in these spaces where we're teaching young children, you know, what it is, what it means to be a good person, you know? Yes. So, yeah. And even that, Blippi, I love Blippi. I know you know Blippi, you probably- Yes, are. I know Blippi all too well. <laughs> and the great thing about Blippi, it's not cartoon, it's just him. And it's a real life scenario, which I love. And just his voice, the way he talks to children, the way he engages them. I think of like the Disney princess and princess voice. That's early childhood. They want to hear that. They don't want to hear those voices that are strong and like, you have to do this. You have to do this. No, we want to feel invited. We want to feel included. And we want to feel happy in your presence. And I think that's what a lot of that has to do with. So, yeah. Wow. Thank you so much. And also just for giving us, I mean, I'm over here subconsciously thinking about treatment ideas with those, yeah. with those name drops that you just gave. Yeah. Um, I do want to pivot a little bit and, you know, you definitely accomplished so much and even you being in this space speaks volume, but I know that we were talking a little bit about it off air. Imposter syndrome is something that of course, so many of us struggle with. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about what imposter syndrome means to you? You know, I know you were talking a little bit about where it even comes from right. and strategies that you use to battle that. 
especially as uh, one of the minority within a small field. Perfect. So, well, you know, I, I didn't really think much about the term until I started my joint doc program. And, and so, of course, as you know, a media junkie as you are today on your phone, it, it was a lot of me trying to see insight of what it means to be a PhD student. What does it mean to, uh, what is a dissertation? What does that look like? Uh, what are all of these conferences I need to go to? What are all of these conferences that I need to speak at? It, 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 there's a lot attached to that. It, it's anxiety, it, it's, it, it's a lot of pressure. You know, it's a lot of, uh, it, it could also stem from trauma. So uh, I think that imposter syndrome to me is not feeling like you are capable to reach the goal or to do exactly what you want it to do. And so um, and, and just thinking of that, it, it's really, it's it's really tough to try to get out of that, you know, that, mm -hmm. that imposter syndrome. But um, I think it really, to me, it means surrounding yourself with people who understand you, you know, who who care for you, who are kind of on the same wavelength that you, that can support you when you uh, are having tough times. And and um, luckily, through the program so far, and then this whole idea of imposter syndrome is slowly dissipating, you know, having wonderful uh, professors who support you and understand your why and understand, you know, what types of research you want to do and why it's meaningful to you. Um, also having colleagues who can really bring more into, you know, your understanding of what you think is great for you and then them bringing their piece and helping you improve yourself. Uh, um, I've just been so lucky, you know, in that regard. So, um, yeah, I hope that answers the question. <laughs> it, it's it, very is. <laughs> it is, it is. And I'm, you know, one of the things, and I hope that there's not too much of an echo on my AirPods. Mm -hmm. um, one word, you know, and if you're comfortable talking about it, is how you said it could come from trauma. So mm -hmm. if you are open to talking about, you know, any experience that you might have had that might be common to other men in our industries. Sure. I think that big thing is just being a man in early childhood special education or a man in education or a man in early education, which are three very different things that bring different questions. But I mean, it, it, there's a lot of um, issues within that and a lot of stereotypes that I've heard, you know, just a lot of parents or maybe even co-workers having kind of misconceptions perceptions about you and oh, why are you working with young children and of course that brings fear you know about like oh potential abuse ch child abuse but it's also important to know that abuse can stem from anywhere and can be brought to someone from anyone right and and uh, and as we talk at a broader scale about imposter syndrome and understanding children of why they are the way they are or why they do what they do can really stem from trauma they've had in the past. Um, and uh, I'd say for myself, it's, uh, I've been lucky to have such a great, you know, family and, and such great friends, but uh, for a lot of people that I know in the field, it, it's a lot of like, almost feels like a pressure to rewrite the how they were wronged you know and and mm -hmm. uh, i i think that um that pressure can sometimes come with the price i mean i i think that as important as it is to bring these topics uh into fruition and, and it's also important to understand that you know be super just be super conscientious that you have made this really great effort to be exactly who you are and, and do exactly what you do. Um, and, and and for me personally, I've had, you know, once in a while, a parent tell me like, why are you doing this? I don't want this student in your classroom because you're a guy, <laughs> you know? And of course that brings back to like, oh, what do I need to prove to this parent? And it's like, no, I don't need to prove anything to this parent. If that parent doesn't feel comfortable working with you, then so be it. But if they do try to open up, just be your best self, just show what you're about, you know, show what you do and how you can help them and, and support them uh, work with their child. Uh, that That's really what it comes to mind for me. Yeah. Wow. Well, 
Thank you so much for unpacking that a little bit on the show. Um, that is just a very different specific trauma that, you know, as women, we don't necessarily, we don't necessarily, you know, think about. Yeah. Um, I do want to know about any other societal or cultural norms that contribute to the underrepresentation of men in these fields. Oh, you know, there's a lot of things. And, and I think if I maybe dive in closer to early childhood special education, I'd also mm -hmm. say just the in involvement of fathers. I think uh, the way that fathers are in the in the lives of their 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 children plays such a significant part in that. Um, but it's important as people in our field to to know that uh, it's always important to presume their involvement in their child's life, right? Um, so. Uh, as a special educator, I always want to make sure that I can include the father in whatever it is going on in the child's life. You know, um, for for the most part, a lot of what we're seeing sometimes it's it's mostly mothers, and which is great. But that's how society has kind of come into itself is that we are seeing more mothers attending IEP meetings. We are seeing more, you know, mothers taking their kids to school and, and, and you know, it, it's really loaded because it could be cultural, you know, dad, you know, in maybe in certain cultures, they are the breadwinner. And so that pressure on the dad is I have to work. So, you know, dad can be holding multiple jobs and have no space or time to be included in, in education. Um, I also think it's, it's the school districts at fault sometimes too. They need to really do, they really need to, you know, do their best to allow for there to be fathers in, you know, in special education and in education. I don't see a lot of events where we really have, you know, like, let's have just the fathers come and see what we do or, you know, father and daughter dances. We don't see that a lot as much as we did before. Um, but at the same time, I also want to note that the landscape is really changing. We are starting to see a lot more dads. You know, we are seeing a lot of a lot more women who take on the role as the ones who are going out in the field, you know, bringing in the money. Um, so it's good to see that there are some fathers out there who are um, actively being, you know, engaging in their, their child's education. Um, but even with that, I think there's work to be done uh, of how we support them, right? Uh, there's a lot of things uh, within that question in itself that could be a whole nother mm -hmm. podcast of like, you know, now we have same sex parents, right? Um, and, and, and how do we support them? How do we include them? How do we make them feel important in the IEP process? How do we um, teach them about, you know, sure, if we have two dads, like, for example, I've had some family families that I've worked with where there's two dads, and then the, the child would be scared of some of my female coworkers, my paras, because they haven't had that exposure to women before. And the same thing can happen for, you know, for two mothers who they bring them to me and they don't want to work with, the child doesn't want to work with me because they've never had, you know, that representation of men in their lives. So I think it, it's important to note that, uh, it's important for children to kind of be exposed to everything, a diverse field of people in their community, just so that they know like, oh, this is this person and, and this is this person. You know, women and men are very different. You know, they have mm -hmm. different quirks that make them who they are. And and even so, even men who have women, female features that women are have that are more nurturing stereotypically, and, and right. even women who are more, you know, analytical, who are who are very mathematical, which is amazing, you know, it, it's good for children to see a diverse group of people who bring different things to the table, so that when they go out in public, and when they see and when they're exposed to these situations, they grasp more of, you know, what the community is. And this is real, this is a real snapshot. It's not just what I know in my small safety zone. Um, so yeah, I think it's more of like me unpacking a lot of uh, what I see, but uh, that's what I've noticed and what I'm currently researching. So 
Oh, Ooh, that is so cool. I hope to have you back on the show, especially when you get deeper into your research and maybe even when you start. I don't I don't have you started the dissertation process yet? No, we're we're okay. mostly working on like literature reviews and and really diving into the research. So um a lot of what I'm doing right now is studying um men of color in special education spaces and more specifically with retention, uh, teacher retention, uh, teacher attrition, and teacher recruitment. And, and so I think that kind of is a great place to start in understanding uh, why there's a lack of men, why the men who are there don't stay there, you know, and, and also what are the strategies that recruitment agencies or what schools are doing or even pre-service teaching uh, programs are doing to really help facilitate that because a lot of what I'm seeing now is a lot of the research that I'm doing I'm not seeing a diverse body of research on 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 men of color who are Asian and Pacific Islander or uh, or Latino background it, it's mostly black educators which is great i love that but what i'm reading there too is it's it's a lot of them feel like yeah it's great that they hyped me up for this position and i'm have a purpose but as soon as they get into those positions they feel so isolated it's like they did everything they can to get us in but they they didn't do anything to help us support us while i'm in it you know and that is also very loaded because that has to do with camaraderie, their comfortability of being in maybe a school that doesn't have other men of color, right? Uh, that has to do with, you know, just feeling like they're not supported by their administration. And so um, it, it's research like that where um, I think it's super important to find more data on also other groups across America. So uh, it's something that that's really close to my heart <laughs> and really uh, part of my whole journey. And, and I really want to dive more into that. So. Well, thank you for your willingness to be a piece of the puzzle. Um, that is definitely just a huge part that is missing in our industry and really in, in I, I almost said every industry, but especially in the special education space. So I really hope to have you back on so you can tell us about those findings. And oh, this. Of course. Of course. now let me ask you this. I was about to jump to how can people find you because I know that on your page, you talk a bit about what you're doing. Um, but I do have one final question to ask you. What changes would you like to see overall in this bed space? Changes, I, I'd love to see, I'd love to see more men in the field. You know, guys out there know that if this is what you want to do, do it, you know, try it out, see if it works for you. And if it doesn't, that's OK. Um, I also want to see changes in administrations and in, in educational administrations in, in, in policy of, of how we help support men who are in the field and who don't feel supported. Um, and, and I also would love to see, you know, just for, I'd, I'd love to see parents who really support the need for more men in the spaces. It, it's it's hard to untangle those two things, and it, it's it's hard to you know really take on something that's been going on for so long, and, and just these ideas and expectations of men. But but it, it's good to be supported by parents as well. You know, understand that you know these men do what they do because they're passionate about it right and, and for the most part a lot of us are supported also by women you know we're supported in my classroom alone it's like everyone is women you know and, and it's good to have a gut just to be in their presence and help them feel like hey yeah there's trust here you know there there's ways that we can work together to enhance you know, our curriculum to ways in which we can enhance the behavioral support parts. And and, and so um, I think there needs to be a lot of changes in, you know, teaching parents. So parent training, you know, uh, of how to uh, 
just understanding that there's different types of people. Um, and of course, just diversity training as well, but which is something that can be, you know, really tough, but it's still something that's super important. And uh, so because representation matters and, and yeah, yeah. Wow. wow. Well, thank you. And, you know, the next time we meet, I will ask you what ways we could talk to the parents about bringing DEI into the home. Right. <laughs> you know, because I, I would almost be afraid to step on any toes or, right. you know, but at the same time, this is, we're all a part, we're all a team. And right. this is a part of the mission too. Yes. So where can people find you if they want to know more about you? Sure. So you can find me on Instagram at ITLB. That's I-T-I-E-L-B. Uh, yeah. And I'm happy to answer any questions or provide support in some way. But um, yeah, thank you so much, Melanie, for having me. It's been such a pleasure. Yes, ITL. This is so much fun. And I really can't wait to have you on. And we just got to tell our girl, Jada, thank you so much oh, yes. <laughs> yes. for oh, her, for her help you. with this. Oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, everyone. Well, thank you so much for joining us live. And thank you, everyone who is watching the replay. And we'll see you next time.